Welcome back. Jenny, are there any questions? Yes, there are some questions. One is coming in as well. Uh, was there a time in history that a scientist also used the knowledge of philosophy and religion? Well, yes, actually, uh, the, the, the philosophers that I um, have been describing so far are, uh, are, are thinkers uh, in a very broad way. Uh, that means that uh, they were actually a combination of scientists, philosophy and religion. S some of them had more focus on religion, others were more oriented towards the scientific and philosophical aspects. And in fact, in these days, in Greece, but especially also in um, in ancient Egypt, where many of these Greek also went for studies, uh, these people were also called philosophers. Um, um, so they had a, a different uh, label <laughs> than we are used to, because it was much more uh, common to think about all these different subjects at the same time. So there was not so, such, a, such a distinction as what we have in our society between religion, philosophy and uh, science. Uh, and that is because our society has become so focused on the materialistic side of, of life that we have a, an extreme focus on that separate from other things. And that was not the case in those cultures. So that was more an integral approach. Nice, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Then the other question is, uh, why did certain mystery schools have their specific approach, uh, like a more scientific or a more philosophical uh, approach? Does that have to do with the period in time or the development of the student? Well, uh, it must uh, it, it had something to do with the development of the student, but these different schools with their different focus existed at the same moment. So what was very common is that people uh, went uh, to the, the mystery school of Eleusis for a number of years and then moved to Samutrace to, to learn the, 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 the items that were the focus there in the teachings. And the same was the case in ancient Egypt, where you also had different mystery schools, different temples, in, uh, in uh, Sais, in uh, Memphis, and so on, all these places. And they all had different uh, curriculum, so to say, and a different focus. And the same uh, was for ancient India, where you had the Satashanas, the six uh, schools, six philosophical schools, but in fact the first two were mainly focused on science and things like mathematics, the other two were more philosophical and the last two were um, mostly mystical and religious focused. So you see that in all cultures uh, there were accents uh, while these schools were uh, existing at the same moment, but then also the teachers had their uh, different uh, focus in the fields they were uh, specialized in, although the basis of the teaching was, was or should be the same, uh, the, the universal science or the universal uh, wisdom religion, the Theosophia, uh, from which these various fields were uh, further uh, elaborated. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, one other question uh, came just in by email, and that is: uh, Can you say that the source of all knowledge of the great scientists that they are all traceable to the Theosophia? In fact, yes. The basic, the fundamental ideas, and we will see that also next week when we are going to talk about metaphysics. Uh, the, the real understanding of, of uh, the phenomena in nature, whether it is in physics or in biology, uh, is 
only possible if you start from the basic idea which I have uh, emphasized uh, in the first part of this lecture, and that is that the whole cosmos is based, is, is embodied consciousness. And that means that all matter that we see and that we study as matter is in fact animated matter. And that is derived this concept from the first proposition of the secret doctrine, and that is the boundlessness of life. And in fact, all sound and, and, and true science is now or will in the future be derived from this starting point. And if you um, deviate from this starting point, which is actually the first proposition of the Theosophia, of the secret doctrine, and if you don't take that as your starting point, you will run into all kinds of issues which are not explainable in a fundamental way and will lead to all kinds of side branches in science which is describing phenomena in a very uh, yeah, difficult to understand way and in fact gives problems that cannot be solved during decades as long as it is not uh, departing from this fundamental assumption that everything is alive in the cosmos, that all matter is animated matter. So yes, we can say that the real science, true science that is uh, not changing every 10 years, is or should be based on the theosophical starting points of uh, that the cosmos is embodied consciousness. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. That's right. That were the questions? Okay. Thank you very much for the uh, very good questions. We now move on to the second part. Uh, and we will now talk about the influences of universal science of antiquity antiquity up to and including the 18th century, but first we will have to deal with the second part of uh, the uh, um, schools in ancient Greece, and we will continue with uh, the so-called nature philosophers, uh, the so-called atomists like uh, Democritus, uh, and also with Empedocles, and uh, they uh, also had a lot of ideas about matter, animated matter. Um, the atomists derive their name from the word atom, which is uh, derived from atomos, and that means indivisible. Uh, the idea that the matter consists of particles and that the atom is the smallest and indivisible part or particle in matter. Uh, and we see actually that from Anaxagoras to Epicurus, the Roman Lucretius, and even much later in the Renaissance, Galilei, they all assumed animated matter. Although the atomist Democritus had a rather materialistic theory of atoms driven by blind forces. And I want you, in the first part, that you always have to watch whether they, the philosophical ideas of these thinkers was really based on a spiritual starting point or on a materialistic starting point. Uh, and Anaxagoras, for instance, did assume animated atoms. Uh, in the Theosophic Theosophia, we also come across the concept of the atom or life atom, and with this is meant the imperishable nucleus of a living being. If we talk about a life atom, often also the term monad is used, for this is the sense of a unit of an entity of a life center. The uh, philosopher Empedocles stated that the elements of nature interact 
through the forces of love and hate. And we would say nowadays the forces of attraction and repulsion. Or that forces are bipolar with attracting and repelling poles. Think, for instance, about a magnet with a North Pole and a South Pole. The North Pole where, uh, with the, which is the attracting pole and the South Pole which is the repelling pole. We go to the next philosopher, Plato. Plato was investigating the truth via the so-called deductive method. That means going from universal propositions to particulars, to the particular facts. Plato's picture of the world is as follows. The idea of the good, his name for the boundless, with ensuing the world of being, the noble world of the noumena, and the world of becoming, the visible world, the world of the phenomenon. Plato gave a very universal definition of a living being, namely that a living being is characterized by a body which is capable of acting and being acted upon. It is also called self-motion. In the Dialogues of Plato, Socrates concludes with his students that the so-called pair of opposites, such as hot and cold, have the characteristic that the opposites can merge into each other. And there are no exceptions to this. Also, life and death uh, comply with this principle. So, the students of Socrates conclude that there is a cyclicity of life, that there is really a thing like reincarnation. Plato goes on to explain that cyclical movement in the form of a circular motion, for instance in the case of a comet in the cosmos, are the first signs of its own character and free will. Plato further taught the hierarchical structure of the universe and that harmony in this hierarchy is the basis of nature. Then we go to the philosopher Aristotle. He was a student of Plato. In the course of his life, he followed a different course from his teacher Plato whose ideas he misrepresented. Aristotle was a great advocate of the inductive method. He collected many facts about nature in order to develop theories. He did so because he found it difficult to reason from the idea that the cosmos is embodied consciousness. The inductive method and his emphasis on collecting material facts were the great model for doing science for many centuries. But he is the example of a non-universal scientist. Then we go to Zeno of Citium. He was the founder of Stoicism, the dominant philosophical school of late Hellenism and the Roman Empire. Zeno lived approximately 100 years after Plato, and he was a continuator of ideas of Pythagoras, Socrates and Plato. He was then succeeded by Cleanthus. The Stoic philosophy consisted of five main lines. They considered the great whole, the cosmos, as a large organism in which everything is alive. Second, the birth of the cosmos, 
from the flow of life, pneuma, the prima materia, emerged by emanation, the realms fire, air, water and earth. The third element was krasis, everything is connected to everything else in a web of life. And the successor of uh, Zeno, Chrysippus, gave the following illustration of this. If you drop one drop of wine into the ocean, it has its effects everywhere in the cosmos, however small that may be. The fourth point was that thinking is central. And the fifth point is about ethics and happiness, living in harmony with nature. If you want to know more about the philosophy of the Stoics, please uh, seek on our website to the recent lecture of Joke Vermeulen on Stoic philosophy on peace of mind of 22nd of January of this year, and you will learn more about the subject. Finally, we go to uh, Claudius Ptolemy, who was a universal scientist of Alexandria. He inventoried the existing ideas on cosmology and astronomy and astrology. He wrote a book, The Complete Exposition of Astronomy, which the Arabs called the Almagest, in which the geocentric worldview played an important role. Geocentric is that the Earth is in the center and the Sun and other planets are orbiting around it. Indeed, at its core was the doctrine of spiritual hierarchies with ten spheres of different degree of materiality in the cosmos influencing each other. In particular, astrological influences on life on Earth was described. Ptolemy's teachings were interpreted exclusively in a materialistic way in the Middle Ages. So primary material geocentric worldview remained and this would last till about 1500, so a very long time. Finally, briefly, we also find uh, Later on, Plotinus, very important philosopher of antiquity and founder, together with his teacher Ammonius Saccas, of what would later be called Neoplatonism, and he is well known for his uh, propagation of the emanation doctrine. Let's now try to summarize some of the universal ideas from antiquity. And we do that with the three propositions of the uh, Theosophia as the frame of reference. So we see that most of these philosophers start from the starting point that the cosmos is embodied consciousness. As we stated in the Theosophica, Theosophia, we talk about the boundless. And that force and matter are one, and that all is manifested is alive. The second, the second proposition is about cyclic motion, and we see that most of these philosophers have an understanding of the cyclic motion that is the appearance and disappearance of life, like we see we just saw in the pairs of opposites, uh, which was part of the dialogues of Plato. Also was recognized the cyclic visible physical motion in the cosmos, that, that is a first expression of an individual being with its own character and a free will. And the idea of self-motion, the ability to act and react as a characteristic for an animated and living being. 
And thirdly, the uh, uh, cosmos and nature is a hierarchy of different layers of force and matter, where force and matter are relative. And that hierarchies emerge via the process of emanation. Everything is therein connected to everything. And also the aspect of growth. Everything is constantly developing. Harmony is the basis for natural growth. And forces are continuously in balance. <clears throat> in the Middle Ages, under the influence of the Christian Church, universal scientific ideas were very few. The material worldview, as it existed in the West, was also very limited. The Earth was seen as a flat and immobile disk. The Earth as the center of the cosmos around which everything revolves. And of course, there was a monotheistic religion. All this changed in the Renaissance when people began to rediscover the universal ideas of science and philosophy in antiquity. And it starts around uh, 1460, uh, 1450, under the influence of the Medici family in Florence, where a new impulse was given to Neoplatonic thought. Under the leadership of uh, Marsilio Ficino, the works of Plato and the Neoplatonists were translated from Greek into Latin to make them accessible to a wider group of people. A study group formed around Ficino, the Platonic Academy, including Pico della Mirandola, lasted for some 25 years. From this academy, a stream of innovation sweeps all through Europe. And in fact, the influence of this academy can still be felt today. Then we see different kind of philosophers and scientists bring contributions to uh, the thinking in the uh, scientific world in the West. We see, for instance, Copernicus, an astronomer, and he stated the idea that the Earth rotates daily around its axis and also that it follows an orbit around the Sun. It is the rediscovery of the heliocentric concept. Next, we see a philosopher called Giordano Bruno, which was a forerunner of modern science and philosophy. He drew mainly on Pythagoras' ideas. Some of Bruno's ideas were as follows. He accepted Copernicus heliocentric system, and he also assumed the boundlessness of the cosmos. He was condemned to the stake by the Inquisition in 1600 for refusing to rank, recant his ideas. Then followed Galilei. He followed also the ideas of Pythagoras and Copernicus concerning the heliocentric view. He mapped the nature of the movement of the Earth and the planets and was forced by the Inquisition to recant his heliocentric ideas, for Galilei feared the fate of Giordano Bruno. Then we see the astronomer Johannes Kepler, a very good example of a universal scientist. He also took Copernicus' model seriously. And Kepler assumed the cosmos as embodied consciousness. He subscribed to the 
Pythagorean's ideas about the planet as being rational, intelligent beings revolving around the sun in which dwells a pure spirit of fire, the source of general harmony. He is best known for his laws on planetary motion. The first law about the orbit of a planet around the sun, which is an ellipse and not a circle. The second law, where the imaginary line joining a planet and the sun sweeps equal areas of space during equal time intervals as the planet orbits. But the most important law is the third law, the law of harmony. For all the planets in the solar system, the orbital dimensions of the ellipse and the orbital velocity are such that they all satisfy the same ratio formula in which these uh, quantities occur. And that fulfillment of that formula indicates that there is unity and harmony in the solar system, in the motion of all these planets. Madame Blavatsky notes on this third harmony law that it reflects that there is a limited permissible fluctuation in the elliptical orbit and the elliptical period followed by these planets. And since the gravitational field remains unchanged, this can only be due to an external cause. And from Theosophia, we then like to point to the free will of the consciousness operating behind a planet. Kepler attributed the gravitation force to the magnetic attraction between bodies and according to Madame Blavatsky, rightly so. Then we move on to the 17th and 18th century. We see then the specialized scientist Descartes, who was also a philosopher. In the West, Descartes is considered one of the fundamental thinkers on scientific questions. He was radical in his thinking to arrive at unquestionable insights. Well known is his statement, cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore, I exist. That was the starting point in his thinking. There was no doubt about that with him. About his contribution to science, from a theosophical perspective, we are not only positive. His idea was that consciousness and force would be completely separate from matter. And this idea persisted for hundreds of years until the 20th century and led scientists around the world astray. Then we go to Isaac Newton. Newton really was a universal scientist. He built on the work of Copernicus, Galileo and Kepler. But the main idea about the attraction of bodies in his theory of gravity, Newton borrowed from the mystic Jacob Böhme. But Newton was also well acquainted with the teachings of Pythagoras. He was a deeply religious man and a great scientist who has had great significance for science and engineering up to this present day. In his masterpiece, the Principia, he formulates three laws for moving objects and a new theory for gravity. In his Principia, Newton states that by his formulas, gravity becomes mathematically defined. But he leaves it to the reader what causes that gravity force, material 
or non-material. That in his premises, in Principia, he assumes a vacuum between bodies that attract each other. But in his correspondences with his colleague Bentley, he intimates that he is gradually thinking of something like a spirit or an ethereal medium, in other words, something like the ether. And the scientists Euler and Leibniz had similar ideas like that. Then we go to Leibniz, who actually was more a philosopher than a scientist, but Leibniz, as a contemporary of Newton, was a strong intuitive philosopher and mathematician. He came close to theosophy in his ideas about the cosmos. He stated that an active energy constitutes the essence of matter and that the cosmos is a large living organism and is composed of interwoven hierarchies of beings. He used the concept of the monad in the same way as Pythagoras, that is that the spiritual atoms of the cosmos form the building blocks of the cosmos. And he stated that everything in nature develops develops step by step through evolution. Well, this is the second part of uh, the lecture. Uh, you know, we are going to uh, take a break of three minutes and uh, please send in your uh, questions, which we will answer, answer after the break. See you later. Welcome back. Yes. Jenny, any questions? There are some questions. Yeah. Yes, the first uh, question is, uh, assuming the metaphor that one drop of wine in the ocean has such a great impact, can I also relate that influence to the indivi individual human being as a thinker? Yeah, I think uh, that's a very good point. If um, this, this, this influence of one drop of wine uh, has such an enormous, uh, or, or has a small impact already in the complete ocean or even in the cosmos, that's what the Greek philosopher said, then you can imagine that if you have think about ideas that we as human beings are thinking, uh, and which also uh, can, uh, let's say, um, spread so easily through the mental atmosphere that uh, what we think really matters uh, because it is also uh, can have a big influence on the rest of the world via the mental planes and I gave at the beginning of this lecture a small example of that that if you and then I quoted one of the masters of wisdom who said that if you uh, study truth and you, you find a, uh, a, a, an idea of truth which is also uh, taking care of the ethical aspect of it, then it is not only that this idea will spread, and when it is also a universal idea, uh, then it will not only spread all around the world, but it also will remain in time, have a very uh, benevolent influence on the world. So it is not only in, let's say, the, the spheres of, the mental spheres where it will have its influence in the world, when it is a universal and ethical sound idea, it will have a big impact in a very big uh, sphere. But also in time it will last longer and will have in during a long period a beneficial effect on humanity. So yes, uh, it is very important to think about, uh, uh, to have, uh, to, to, yeah, to, to, to try to understand what is real and what is an illusion and also taking into account that it has to be universal, that it has to be balanced 
from the scientific, philosophical and religious side that it is also an ethical sound idea because then the impact will be very large on society and all life on Earth. Okay, thank yeah. you very much. Uh, then the second question is, I think, related to this. Uh, that is, uh, did the mystery schools also have an impact in their societies? Yes. Well, I think the uh, the answer is yes. Although they uh, are a little bit, always were a little bit withdrawn from society, uh, and and some of the teachings were uh, kept secret. Although they had. <coughs> They had in the in the time of the Greek, but also in the time of ancient Egypt, they had the lesser and the greater mysteries. The lesser mysteries were kind of dramas uh, in 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 the form of uh, yeah drama, where uh, teachings were actually um, uh, uh, presented in a hidden way via drama, uh, but with ideas that were explained more explicitly in the uh, in the greater mysteries where uh, students uh, who were uh, or chelas who were so far that they could go to the real initiations were told more of these uh, truths uh, but the so the impact of these mystery schools were was that people could hear about the truths that were taught in those schools via the lesser mysteries, but also that if you uh, uh, could grasp these truths be, via your intuition, it could have an effect on your scientific insights, but also in um, the governance of uh, the cities and the countries. And what you see, and that is uh, known in history, that, for instance, the school of Pythagoras uh, had as an influence on society that uh, uh, everybody in the cities knew that the Pythagoreans had ideas that were not identical with the local uh, rulers of that area. And that caused, because the rulers who tended to be uh, autocratic rulers, they uh, feared uh, the influence of this Pythagorean school. And in fact, this school of Pythagoras had to move a number of times in order to, uh, to avoid persecution, uh, persecution by, by uh, these rulers. And in fact, the last time they settled down somewhere, uh, most of the students of the school were killed by the ruler there. Uh, I forgot his name, but he was a very cruel uh, ruler. So this is a negative example, but it only indicates in relation to the question asked that there was always interaction between these mystery schools and the, and the country or the cities where they were active. And uh, sometimes it was a very positive effect that uh, people learned and the whole culture uh, uh, was uh, raised to a higher level. But in times when uh, cultures went down and people followed autocratic rulers, then there were frictions between these mystery schools and uh, the rulers around it. And it gave... Uh, uh, also social troubles because uh, the, the mystery schools try to keep uh, all the ideas pure uh, and that was not to the liking of these autocratic rulers. And you see the same things again in the world in every country where there is uh, let's say uh, martial law or uh, autocratic rulers, you see that uh, the free thinking of people is suppressed. And, uh, and, and you see this happen regularly in life. And this was also the case in the time when mystery schools still existed. I hope this uh, will answer the question more or less. Yes, thank you yeah. very much. 
Uh, one more question about all these uh, scientists and uh, philosophers. Uh, they picked up on each other's ideas. And is it uh, true that the ideas became more and more clear and true by that? Well, I think that that is a little bit difficult to conclude. You can see that there is a build up of more uh, uh, ideas. If you look at the, the, the uh, classical Greek, actually the first big uh let's say universal concepts uh are are really uh, which which you can identify as re being really very universal is starting with pythagoras pythagoras studied in egypt and in india and you can see that he gained a lot of knowledge and wisdom and all the philosophers after Pythagoras, including Socrates and Plato, actually uh, uh, started by studying his ideas. So yes, there is a kind of build up, but it is also, you see, that the, the, the pupil of uh, Plato, Aristotle, who actually had a lot of impact for centuries on the science uh, in uh, Western Europe, was not following uh, precisely the ideas of Plato and Pythagoras anymore. So you see, yes, it builds up, but it also slides down once in a while. And it, so it's, it is uh, a little bit a bumpy uh, uh, way of development. And sometimes you see a peak again, uh, for instance, when you, say, you see uh, Plotinus, uh, the Neoplatonist, who is giving an impulse again upwards, but you see then also it's going down when people start following more or less the ideas of Aristotle during the Middle Ages, because they cannot grasp the idea of the boundless and the fact that the universe is, uh, is an embodied universe, is an animated universe. And so it's going up and down. There are times that it goes up and there are times that it goes down. Okay, thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. That were the questions. That were the questions. Okay, thank you very much for the good questions. And we continue now to the last part, which is uh, focusing 